All right, guys, I want to ask you guys to uh, just join me. Let's pray for a second because I need it. Father God, I just, I thank you so much for this privilege, Lord. I thank you so much for your church, which you have built here, Lord. I thank you for Moses for putting on him the faithfulness, Lord, to continue pursuing you, Lord, even when things don't go well and when they do go well, Lord, but to always keep our eyes on you. I thank you for giving Moses that faithfulness and for leading us all to do the same. And Lord, I pray that you would do that here tonight, Lord, that you would lead us. Lord, you have taught me a message on leadership this week. And I pray that that teaching would not have ended yesterday or any moment before now. Lord, but that you would continue teaching me that message and that you would use me right now to teach your church that message. Lord Jesus, we ask that you come in here and like a good husband to a bride, Lord, lead your bride right now. Lead your church. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, we're not here to entertain anybody. We're not here to get a check mark. Lord, we're here to meet with you, to experience your presence, to know you more. Lord, this is us drawing near to you. We ask that you would draw near to us right now. Lord, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God's been teaching me about leadership, and you're probably thinking, well, thank God the worship leader is finally learning leadership. I know. I know the band is thinking the same thing, but <laughs> your face has said it. God really started teaching me leadership when I, I'd say I was probably about 17 years old. I, I started to, um, I, I actually I became hooked to the, the teachings of pastor and teacher John Maxwell. Um, as soon as I was introduced to his teaching, it was like everything I could take in. I'd read every book I found by him, everything. I, and he was and is a master of leadership. He was a pastor for 25 years. And, you know, he would always uh, teach these big business seminars with just hundreds of, of these big business tycoons and people who generally weren't Christians at all. And so each time that he would finish his message or his lesson, whatever he was teaching, they would come up to him and just, just kind of drag it out of him. Man, where do you get your stuff? Where do you teach from? Like, where do you get this stuff? And each time he'd kind of warn them, like, knowing they're not Christians. He's like, you may not want to know, you know? Like, so they would keep dragging it, keep pulling it out of him. He said, all right, if you want it, everything that I teach on leadership comes from the book of Proverbs. You see, God's word is enough on every stage in life, over the hundreds of thousands of people that John Maxwell speaks to, everything that he gets is directly from God's word. God's word is enough. As smart as we think we are, as much wisdom as we think we have, we will eventually realize that it all originated in God's word. The question is, do we trust God's word? Do we trust that it truly contains our best? Do we trust that his word exists for our own good? Or we, do we doubt it when following his word means going against our instincts? The other thing that John Maxwell would always say, this is the one, the one quote of his that always stuck in my head, and Jamie probably hates it sometimes, but he'd always say, everything rises and falls on leadership. And she hates that because I blame myself a lot when whatever I'm leading isn't going well. But it's true. God holds leaders accountable for the crowd that he leads. Simply stated, leaders will have to answer for the actions of the people that they follow. The shepherd will have to answer for the actions of the sheep. Moses will have to answer for the actions of this church. I, the worship leader, will have to answer for the actions of the worship band. The worship band will have to answer for the church as it pertains to worship. And the church as a whole will have to answer for the actions of the community in which they existed. I truly believe that when we get to the day of judgment, God is going to say, Moses, what did you do with the church that I gave you? To me, he'll say, Kyle, what did you do with the worship band that I gave you? To the worship band, what did you do with the church that I entrusted you to lead to worship me? And to the church, he'll say, what did you do with the community that I placed you in? I didn't put you there just to show up every Saturday at 6 o'clock and hear a nice rosy message and then go home and go back to your week. He's going to say, I put you in Eustace for a reason. 
What did you do with that? Did you lead the community that you existed in? And here's the thing. Unfortunately, God won't be accepting excuses when we get there. To the husband whom he asks, what did you do with the wife that I gave you? Oh, well, I, I, I was busy working and I, you know, I... Nope. No excuses. To your children, what did you do with the children that I entrusted to you? Well, I, you know, I was out there making money and I was trying to make sure that they were... Nope. No excuses. To the church, to the worship band, to the pastor, to the business leader. Jared, all of your employees, they're not there just to make you money. You know that. You tell us all the time how you've got a ministry, and it's true. Everything that we do in life is our ministry. God, as the Christians, he has called us to lead those around us. Now, real quick, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, I want to make sure that we're in agreement on that fact that God's word exists because he loves us, right? Every word of God he has given us because he loves us. God says, do this because it's good for you. Don't do this because it's bad for you. Now, here's something neat that I realized this week. Three of the Ten Commandments tell us what to do. Seven of the ten tell us what not to do, right? And what we'll see in our study tonight is, is what not to do as leaders. And we can thank Aaron, Moses' cousin, for screwing up and taking the heat for us. He screwed up so many times in leading his people. You see, in my opinion, true wisdom is learning from the mistakes of others. And true foolishness is making them. If somebody else has already made the mistakes, do we really have to go back and make them again? Or should we not lead from those mis or learn from those mistakes? So we're going to learn from the mistakes of Aaron. And we're going to be looking mostly in the book of Exodus. But first, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You there? Good. We're just going to read this one verse. It says, and this is Jesus speaking directly to his people. You are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. Notice, cannot be hidden. Not only as Christians can we not be hidden, but in fact... Aren't we constantly under a microscope, under a much more powerful microscope than the rest of the world? Why is that? Why is everybody looking at us? Who cares about it? Why aren't we all just putting Buddhists under the microscope? Why don't we put atheists under the microscope or, or Wiccan? That, that one's interesting, right? That'd be cool to observe for a while. How come Christians are constantly under a much more powerful microscope than the rest of the world? Exactly. Because we state claim to the standards which the whole world desires to uphold. But we have the ability to uphold those standards because we have Christ. Amen? Yeah. We have the only Savior capable of giving us the power to uphold those standards which we claim. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. The whole world naturally wants these things. It may not look like it a lot of times. You watch the news, it doesn't seem like it. But it's the truth. Like you said, the whole world... You see, here's, here's really the thing. Here's the real foundation of it. The whole world believes in God. I don't care who you are. I don't care how strong an atheist you are, how good you are at stifling or refuting your belief in God. You know God exists. <laughs> Romans 1 19 and 20 says so. It says that the whole world knows God exists. We see him in the creation. And consequently, we all have this innate understanding of the value of truth, of love, joy, peace, patience. The whole world wants those things. But there's a problem. We can't have those things without Christ. In and of ourselves, there exists not the ability to uphold these standards. We need a Savior in order to get there. And here's really the thing. Once we get there, once we as the Christians are there, guess what? 
It's our job to lead the rest of the world there. God didn't save us for our own comfort so that we could just keep the gift to ourselves. Romans 10, 14 says, But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Who is it that Paul is antagonizing here? It's us. It's the Christians. You see, Christians, we are the leaders of the world. Why? Because everybody desires to have what only we can have. The only way they can get that which they desire is if we will lead them to Christ, the way, the truth, the life. You see, it's quite simple. Satan wants to lead them to suffer. Jesus wants to lead them to be free. Satan wants to use you to lead them astray. Jesus wants to use you to lead them to freedom. Nonetheless, regardless of which direction you're leading them, you are always leading. The world is always watching, anxiously waiting to see, is this Christ guy for real? What's up with these Christians? Can he really give them these so-called fruits of the Spirit? Does he really love them even though they always screw up? Is he really the way to eternity? The world is always watching you, seeking answers to those questions. But that's in fact quite the problem. The problem is they're looking to Christians to figure out what he's like. And since we don't know how to lead them to him, they abandon God for absolutely anything else around that they can worship. And you'll see that in our study here tonight. As soon as the Israelites weren't sure of where God was, Aaron said, uh, gold calf, here, worship this. Anything else, any other high-sounding philosophy or garbage that anybody else can come up with, as soon as they see a Christian fail, they say, okay, I'll try that. The problem is they're looking to us. Thank God, even though we screw up all the time, that we have a Savior, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And thank God for his word, which shall set us free. You see, the whole world has a need for refuge from the enemy of their souls, and it's our job to lead them there. Now, finally, getting to our scripture, let's, let's flip to Exodus chapter 24. I want to set this whole story up for you as far as what's going on here and what we see in the leadership of these people. Exodus 24, verse 1. In Exodus 24, verse 1, uh, God is calling Moses to come up the mountain. Verse 1, he says, The Lord instructed Moses, Come up here to me and bring along Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of Israel's elders. All of you must worship from a distance. Jump to verse 9 with me. Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel climbed up the mountain. There they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue lapis lazuli, as clear as the sky itself. And though these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy them. In fact, they ate a covenant meal, eating and drinking in his presence. Now finally go to verses uh, 15 through 18. Then Moses climbed up the mountain, and the cloud covered it. And the glory of the Lord covered it for six days. I jumped there, I skipped the line. The glory of the Lord settled down on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from inside the cloud. To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. Then Moses disappeared into the cloud as he climbed higher up the mountain. He remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I think in this we see the order of accountability, accountability of the church responsible for leading the world. First, we see the church at the base of the mountain, right? The people who weren't called to climb partway up the mountain. And then we see the elders plus Moses, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, halfway up the mountain. And then finally, God calls Moses up to the top of the mountain. I think in that we see the order of accountability. First, of course, God on top, then his first leader, Moses, then Aaron, and the elders, 
and then below the church as a whole. So just something simple, a simple observation there, but I want to notice these things, this real important stuff before we move on. In verse 17, it says, To the Israelites at the foot of the mountain, the glory of the Lord appeared at the summit like a consuming fire. You see, the people, they could flat out see where God and Moses were. They knew what God and Moses were doing because they were told so in verses 3 and 4. Let's look at that. Then Moses went down to the people and repeated all the instructions and regulations the Lord had given him. All the people answered with one voice, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. Then Moses carefully wrote down all the Lord's instructions. Early the next morning, Moses got up, built an altar at the foot of the mountain. He, he also set up 12 pillars, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. So the people clearly knew where God and Moses were, what they were doing, and they also knew exactly what they, as the church, were supposed to be doing. We see that in verse 1, where he says, in the second half of the verse, the rest of you must worship from a distance. So the people have been told what to do, where God was, where Moses was, what they would be doing the whole time. Now jump to Exodus 32 with me. Verse 1. When the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Come on, they said. Make us some gods who can lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. If you're taking notes, write this down. What not to do as a leader. Number one, disregard the word of God. You see the Israelites, Aaron, Everybody here in the midsection of the mountain, they knew exactly where God was. They knew exactly where Moses was and what they were doing and what they, as the people, were supposed to be doing. You see, as we said earlier, the whole world is watching us to know what God is like and how to follow him. And here's the thing, how can we lead them properly if we will not even follow him? If God gives us his commands and tells us what to do, and we don't even follow those commands, how can the rest of the world follow us to him? These people were told exactly what they should be doing, and even they weren't following. And they could see the presence of God. They knew exactly where he was and what he was doing. See, Proverbs 30, verse 5 says, Every word of God is flawless. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. God has provided us with his word for our guidance, like we said earlier, for our protection. And when we refuse to obey his word, when we refuse to believe his word or follow it, what we're really saying is one of two things. Either I don't believe his word is true, like I, I don't trust God, I kind of like my way better, or I just flat out like suffering better. James McDonald always says two options, choose to sin, well one option, choose to sin and choose to suffer. Choose to disobey God's word and choose to suffer. And that's exactly what the people here were doing. Why? Did they not believe God? Did they not believe? I mean, we always say seeing is believing. They could see, and they still didn't believe. They knew what was going on. God spoke directly to them and told them what to do, and they still weren't obeying. Do we truly grasp the value of God's word? Do we truly believe that when he says do this, that it's because it's for our good? And that when he says, don't do this, it's because it will hurt us. Do we believe that? See, anytime I'm getting ready to do something that goes directly against God's word, I'm saying, either I don't believe his word is true, or I just don't care. I like suffering better. And the people here in verse 1, they knew exactly what they were to be doing, but they didn't care total disregard for God's instructions. And here's really what's interesting. They had been through the ten plagues. They walked through the Red Sea. <laughs> they said, I don't care about the ten plagues. I don't care if God can bring water from a rock. I don't care about the manna from heaven. I don't care if God can part the Red Sea. I don't care how, how many times God has shown me he loves me. Or how many times I have seen that his timing is perfect 
I don't care. I want what I want, and I want it now. Look at their impatience. The very first line, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain. Note this, just because God doesn't do things on your time, praise him. <laughs> Thank God that his time is perfect. Don't turn from him or doubt him. He knows exactly when it should start, how long it should take, how long it should last, and when it should end. His timing is perfect. Look at the foolishness that these people's impatience leads them to. They say, we don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. Really what they're saying is, yeah, he, sure, he, he cared enough to risk his life leading us here. Big deal. He stuck with us every time we've tried to bail on him. Big deal. He told us exactly where he would be and what he would be doing. Big deal. We see where he is now and what he's doing. Big deal. I don't care. I don't know where he's at. Really? We don't know where this Moses guy went. Uh, look up. This would literally be like me walking over to the window and saying, I, I drove my car here. I parked it right outside. I can see it out there right now, but I want it here right now, and it's not here right now. It must have vanished. I better go buy a new car. <laughs> you guys would pad the closet and lock me in there. <laughs> but do you see how we do this to God? When God doesn't do things on our time, but instead does them on his time, if the doubt gets bad enough, we abandon him for our own methods. I know God says if I do my part, if I work and I'm a good steward of my finances, I can trust him to provide sufficient funds for my rent, but, 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 but it's due and I, and I don't have enough money and the world is going to end and I better go freak out and get another job and skip church so I can earn enough money to pay my rent. Yeah, bad plan. You get the point? God's love for you is perfect. His word is the written form of his love. I hear people talking about grace as compared to truth or in contrast to truth. Here's a mind blower for you. In God's grace, he gave you his truth. Because God loves you, he gave you the law. Because God loves you, he gave you the truth, the way, the life. You see, for some reason... The world is just abandoning God's word. What is that reason? It's because those who stake claim to, to following his word, we don't do our jobs to lead them there. When God speaks, Christians listen and lead the rest of the world to do the same. When God says jump, you say, no, don't say anything, just start jumping. <laughs> Christians, we say. <laughs> we start saying, did he say jumpeth or thou shall jump or what is the Greek for jump or? <laughs> Let's keep reading in, in verse 2 of Exodus 32. Let's see Aaron's response to this foolishness of these people. Verse 2, So Aaron said, Take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. Ah, good. Thank God. Aaron gets it. He, he, he's stealing all their stuff because they're disobeying, right? Give me all your good stuff. You don't deserve it, right? Let's see. Keep reading. Verse 3, All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, molded it into the shape of the calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Really, Aaron? You had one job. <laughs> what not to do as a leader, number two? Don't follow the foolishness of those you are supposed to be leading. Especially when it breaks rule number one, disregarding the word of God. These people, they just blatantly disregarded the word of God, came to Aaron and said, hey, we've got an idea. Make us some gods who we can worship. And Aaron followed him. He believed it. <laughs> he bought into it. 
This is something that God showed me this week. Greater is the ignorance of the shepherd who follows the ignorance of his sheep. If you follow the sheep right off the cliff, you're going to die with them, and then you're going to go and answer for why you didn't lead them elsewhere. The same is true of us as Christians. If I come to Moses and say, hey Moses, you know, we, you know we've, been, we've been teaching this whole Bible thing for quite a while, and things don't seem to be going quite our way or on our time, I got an idea. Let's try the Koran instead. I hope Moses is a good enough friend to drop kick me in the face first. And then, of course, lead me away from such foolishness. And when the non believers around you offer you their pseudo philosophies regarding God, or any wisdom for that matter, you kindly, and I emphasize kindly, which I'm still working on. Rip it to shreds by making known to them the truth of God's word. The truth. Can we take them down? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but here's the thing. You, you can't lead them to God's word, to the truth, unless you obey rule one. Not disregarding God's word. You've got to know God's word in order to lead them to it. You see, what's happening is that the world around us is actively abandoning the word of God for some easier to follow, feel good garbage that's leading to the chaos that you see in the news every single day. Everybody's just doing whatever is right, whatever seems right in their own eyes, right? That's what's become of politics as we abandon the Constitution. It's no longer, uh, hold on, let me check the Constitution. Okay, this is what it says. This is what we're doing. No, now it's, well, what does everybody think? What's a, what is the greatest opinion here? And, uh, okay, yeah, we'll just go with that. There's got to be a standard to truth. Otherwise, there is no truth. God's word is that standard of truth by which we base every single decision that we make. You see, it says multiple times throughout uh, the book of Judges, in that time there was no king in Israel. Everybody did whatever was right in their own eyes. And then it goes on to tell some story of absolute chaos that ensued because of it. And that's exactly where, where we're going as the world actively abandons the word of God. But guess who's responsible? Us. Exactly. And the more that we sit back tolerating it, the more responsible we become for the inevitable consequences to follow. We know the truth. We are responsible for telling them. Finish my sentence for me here. Spare the rod. All right, good. Somebody saw my Facebook post. Either that or you're afraid to finish my sentences anymore. You're quick learners. That's good. You know the Bible does not even say, spare the rod, spoil the child. We've come up with that. We say it all the time. Spare the rod, spoil the child. Some hippie-looking poet came up with that in 1662. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says, spare the rod, hate the child. It says, those who love their children care enough to discipline them. I love children. <laughs> Jared loves his children. <laughs> Every day. Now, what's the relevance of this? This isn't a random tangent for no reason. You see, those who spare the rod of discipline for their children, they do so not because they love their child so much, they don't want to hurt their feelings, they, you know, I just don't want to hurt little Timmy. No, they, they spare the rod of discipline so they don't have to hear him cry. Right. I don't want to deal with it. I, I, I just let them get away with it this time, especially in the grocery store. I'm not a parent, but I can imagine. That is kind of annoying when your two-year-old screaming in the cart because you won't let him have lollipops. <laughs> let them scream. I want to give the guy a high five when I walk past him and his two-year-old screaming, right? You see, the reason that people spare the rod is for their own peace. We're just keeping the peace. Don't want to stir anything up. Don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Don't want to step out of my comfort zone or stick my neck out there. And when we stand by, watching the world cave in around us, and we don't speak up and tell them the truth, 
simply because we want to keep our own little peaceful world intact, we show not that we love our friends, but rather that we hate them. We show that we would rather keep our peace, our little peaceful world intact, than to see our friends be set free by the truth of God's word. Now, I'm not saying go out and start spanking your non-believer friends. <laughs> Due to how far they've slipped, they may actually like that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is it's time to stop letting them believe a lie. We are responsible for those whom we lead. We know the truth and it is our job to make it known to them. If we don't do our job, we are responsible. Just as the pastor is responsible for the church, the church is responsible for the community in which they exist. I'm not telling you you're going to answer for the sins of the people over in Africa, but perhaps the guy across the street. God's going to say, that guy, he was there the whole time. How come you didn't go over there? How come you didn't reach out to him? I put you there. I couldn't have made it any easier for you. And of course, he won't be accepting excuses. <laughs> well, I was busy and I, you know, I was leading the worship band and every time I went to the building, I was just so busy I, and I got there usually seven to eight minutes late so I had to run right in the door and do what I was doing. No excuses. Look at what Moses says to Aaron. Moses goes directly to the leader, the one responsible for leading these people and asks him in verse 21. Flip there with me. Should be on the next page. Moses goes directly to the leader. And what does he say? What did these people do to you to make you hate them so bad? Why did you bring such terrible sin upon these people? And I fear that one day God's going to say to me, what did you do? To the, what did these people do to you to make you hate them so bad? Why didn't you lead them? He's saying, Aaron, you were left in charge. These people have completely abandoned God under your watch. Why do you hate them so badly? See, I believe the prophetic meaning of this scripture is that one day God will say to us, I gave you the truth. I left you in charge of telling those around you. And if you have not done your job, he'll say, why did you hate them so badly? What did they do to you to make you withhold the truth from them? And watch this. Aaron tries to make up some cheap excuse. He even lies. There's lying in the Bible. That doesn't mean go do it. Verse 22. Don't get so upset, my Lord. Aaron replied, you yourself know how evil these people are. They said to me, make us gods who will lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So I told them, whoever has gold jewelry, take it off. When they brought it to me, I simply threw it into the fire and out came this calf. <laughs> Aaron just flat out lied to Moses, right? <laughs> but that's not even the bigger point. The bigger point is, watch this, Moses, he doesn't even acknowledge Aaron's cheap excuse. He gets right to work. Apparently Moses still loves these people because he imme immediately initiates discipline. Go to verse 26. Now this is pretty brutal, so just stay with me. So he's at verse 26. So he stood at the entrance to the camp, this is Moses, and shouted, all of you who are on the Lord's side, come here and join me. And all the Levites gathered around him. Moses told them, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Each of you, take your swords and go back and forth from one end of the camp to the other. Kill everyone, even your brothers, friends, and neighbors. The Levites obeyed Moses' command and about 3,000 people died that day. Then Moses told the Levites, Today you have ordained yourself for the service of the Lord, for you obeyed him even though it meant killing your own sons and brothers. Today you've earned a blessing. Now what I see there is, I mean, to say that they're stepping out of their comfort zone, that's a huge understatement. They're killing their sons, brothers, and friends, right? I don't think God has asked any of you to kill your sons, brothers, or friends, but I think he has asked you to unveil to them the truth. Even when it's a little uncomfortable, 
even when I, I'm not really sure how this conversation is going to go, but I, I just have to say something to him. No, I don't think I, don't think I will. It's just going to be too uncomfortable. I can't do that. See, Moses doesn't acknowledge the weak excuse. Moses gets right to work disciplining. See, once again, the, the prophetic meaning of this scripture, I believe here, is Hebrews 4.12. These people were literally taking swords and killing everybody that disobeyed God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You see, when you wield the sword of God's truth, and I don't mean like some lunatic standing out there on the street corner yelling, you're all going to hell. I'd love to see how many converts that guy leads. I'm talking about loving your friends and the people around you enough that you have the guts to stand up and correct them when they are doing or believing something that is in clear contradiction to God's word. Do you have the guts? You have the Savior. You have the truth. Learn it and believe it. You are responsible for leading the people around you to it. Don't let them lead you into some baloney beliefs about some fat bald guy who's dead and in the dirt now. Or to thinking that God is just some hippie love fest and is okay with everything as long as everyone's happy. That's garbage. God's word gives clear direction on what is absolutely best in absolutely every aspect of life. God created life. He knows how to direct you through it. Do you trust him? Do you have the guts to make that truth known to the people around you? And again, I, I truly mean lovingly. Not beating people over the head with the Bible. Sharing to them the truth. When you see your friend getting ready to cheat on his wife or just anything stupid that, you're, that they're getting ready to do. I, uh, I was just destroyed by this this week. Three times, actually, in one week. I always say that when I am preparing a message, I'm kind of scared, like, what to teach, because I know God's going to teach me. <laughs> so it's like leadership. <laughs> like, make it, make it gentle. Like, be easy, God. Well, if you want to hear the dumbest story that has ever existed in all of mankind, <laughs> uh, I'm working on a job site down in Orlando, right? And about a month ago, I'd say, somebody broke in and they tried to steal the hot water heater. <laughs> it was full of water, so they didn't get very far. <laughs> That's not even the dumb part, though. So they couldn't get the hot water heater, so instead they took two five-gallon buckets of paint and two one-gallon buckets of paint. Really? <laughs> like, you better find a, a new illegal career. <laughs> so... They steal the paint, about a month goes by. Three days ago, the next door neighbor of the house that we're working on comes over to me and he says, Kyle, I think I know where the paint's at. I said, you think? <laughs> so he's, he goes, yeah, it's three houses up on the front porch. I'm like, can you go get it? <laughs> now, sounds funny, but that's honestly my first mistake. This is a crime that was committed. I should have said, okay, I'll call the cops. But I didn't. I played along. And so he says, yeah, I'll, I'll go talk to the guy and see what he says. So he goes up the street, talks to the guy. And the guy says, no, that's my paint. And he says, no, it's not. I see the colors of the paint. It belongs at that house up there. And he goes, all right, I'll give it to you for 10 bucks. <laughs> so he comes back and tells me. And... It's just eating me alive the whole time. I'm like, really? Am I really playing in this circus right now? So I call the customer, and it's still, my mistake again. I should have just flat out called the cops. Call the customer, what do you want to do? He's like, well, if we call the cops, they'll probably put him in jail for 30 minutes, and then he'll get out, and he'll come break all your windows or something, you know, start gang wars or something. So we keep playing in this circus instead of doing what the law says to do. And so I give him, I didn't have 10 bucks. I had six bucks on me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
So I give him six bucks. I buy back my paint that he stole from me. <laughs> he gives me the paint back. I told you, dumbest story in all of history. And he gives me my paint back. And that definitely drove me nuts. But the next day, I, like, I could not get this off my chest. And I'm like, it's just the dumb game that gets played around here, you know, big deal. What really was eating me alive was the fact that I didn't even do what I want to lead others to do. That I didn't obey the law. Sounds petty, but this was a crime committed. I should have called the cops. Said, we know where the pain is. Come get it. But I didn't. I'm not even leading. And you kind of think, yeah, in that situation, are they even capable of being led? And how often do we think that in any situation? You know, we're at a car dealership today, and the, the guy that's trying to sell us the car, is a, he's a pastor, and he's like, man, I'm in just in such a filthy world here, just so dark, and it seems so hopeless to lead these people. But he said, I never give up. He said, I keep praying, and God keeps giving me opportunities to lead these people. And he does. And even when we think people are totally hopeless and beyond being led, he can still use us to do that. But we have to initiate that. We have to have the guts to step out there and do it when he calls us to. I should have called the cops. I should have done my job. You see, the Bible says, if you fail, it says anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. And remember, we said that if you spare the rod of God's truth, if you fail to wield the, God, the word, you hate them. And this is saying, if you hate your brother or sister, you're no different than a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. If you refuse to lead those around you, then perhaps you ought to check yourself and make sure you have truly received Christ as your Savior. Study God's word. Love is an action. Reading and learning his word is loving him and simultaneously allowing him to love you. And as you learn, lead others. As you go, make disciples. Jerome told us a little illustration recently of a, a guy that's drowning in the water. And as he's sitting there drowning, a boat comes by. I think it was a canoe first, right? So a canoe comes by and says, hey, man, you want help? He's like, oh, no, God will save me. Don't worry about it. Keep going. So the canoe goes by. And then a little bit bigger boat comes by. Let's say a bay liner. Hey, man, you need help? No, no, God will save me. Go on. Keep going. Keep on your way. And then a yacht comes by. Dude, you need help? No, no, God will save me. The guy dies, goes to heaven, and he says, God, why didn't you save me? He says, I sent a canoe, <laughs> I sent a bay liner, and a yacht. And I think the same is true for us when, when, when God asks us, how come you didn't lead the people around you? And we say, well, I, God, I, I thought you would just do that. You know, I thought that was your job. My job was just to go to church on Saturdays. And, you know, he's going to say, but I sent you to lead them. How come you didn't do your job? I just want to implore you guys, we don't exist still on this earth just to, just to gather this nice comfy life. You know, the world has been falling apart since day six. The Bible says so. And yet we spend all of our time gathering this, the job, the money, the whatever, trying to organize this perfect little life for ourselves. That's not the reason we're still here. Those are good things and those are good responsibilities that we should uphold and that we should be good stewards of the job God gives us and the, the finances and whatever. Our purpose, the reason that you're still breathing oxygen today is because there's somebody out there that God intends to use you to lead. And he's not probably in Africa. He's probably your next door neighbor. It's probably the guy you'll walk past in the store that just needs somebody to smile at him just needs to see a cross on a neck and a smile. Just needs to see that there is hope in this world. That there is a way. That there is truth and there is life beyond this life. Christians, you are the leaders of this world. Do your job. 
Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that you love us enough to give us your word, Lord. Lord, what can we even add to you, Lord? How, how can we have any value to you whatsoever? You're the creator of the universe, Lord. For some reason, you still have us here. You created us, I imagine, for the same purpose a man and woman get married and decide to have children. To bring somebody into this world to love on, to lead, to guide, and to teach to lead those around them. Lord, I pray that you would just fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lord, it's the enemy that keeps us from leading. We know our job now. Lord, as your word says, now that we know the truth, we are accountable to it. But Lord, we still cannot do that unless you will fill us with your Holy Spirit. So Lord, we pray right here, right now, just that you would empty us of anything that stifles that, that, that urge, that call to lead those around us. Lord, get rid of that. Let your voice in our hearts be so strong that we could not possibly ignore it. Lord, that we would have no choice but to lead as you lead us. To love the people around us, Lord. Don't let us sit back silently, tolerant of the just total chaos that is going on in the world around us, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can do the work that you intend to do. Lord, a king's glory is a growing population. That population grows by us doing our job. Give us the strength to do that. Lord God, we praise you. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask uh, the guys to go ahead and pass out communion. Uh, I was, uh, I was kind of thankful last time because nobody came up and handed me a microphone. Instead, this time while Kyle was praying, Moses literally threw it at me. So I have to have a microphone this time. Um, one of the things that Kyle kind of hit on was the trust that we have in the Lord. And just to be able to have that is, is an amazing part in itself. But... Um, one of the verses that kind of hit me was in Proverbs, um, Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. And I think that kind of just sums up everything. I mean, there's nothing, you know, we can do all things through him and it doesn't matter what it is. I kind of felt convicted before when the guys kind of 
asked me to start leading communion because I felt like I wasn't there yet. I wasn't, I didn't have the ability. I didn't know what to say or what to do. But if I put that trust in the Lord, he'll just bring me up here and just start talking. Um, but it's, it's just weird how that works. And there's nothing more personal than taking a communion with my family. And having the ability to share in this bread and this cup with you guys is just, it, it gives you the, the Jesus chills kind of stuff. You know, it's just, it's just a good thing. And it's, it's also good to kind of just close your eyes and just imagine being at that table when, when Jesus gave this to, to his boys. You know, his, his brothers and, and his family on the night that he was betrayed and it's just it's an amazing thing to just imagine yourself being there while you take this communion and to just let him kind of put that sheet of righteousness over you and just hit, hit. like it says it gives me jesus bumps every time i i i do this i don't know what it is it's just weird but um there's a lot of different a few different verses that deal with communion and I, I kind of pick 1 Corinthians all the time just because to me it, it, it allows me to read it and close my eyes and actually help picture that I'm there with him and to know that he's here with me every time I give this communion and so I'm going to read that scripture now for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself on the night when he was betrayed the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it then he broke it in pieces and said this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way he took the cup of wine after supper saying this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. Lord, I want to thank you first and foremost for sending your son Jesus to die for us, Lord. We don't deserve it. And yet, you sent him to save us, Lord, even as sinners. And I just thank you so much for doing that for every single one of us, Lord, because we don't, we don't deserve it sometimes. But I know that you have a reason and a purpose for everything, Lord. And I just thank you so much. And it's in this I ask, amen. just want to call you guys to your feet to worship with us. This song just totally confirms everything that we've spoken of tonight. We are the light of the world. We are a city on a hill. We cannot be hidden. We as the Christians of this world cannot be hidden. Nobody's watching us to see exactly what God's like, to see how to get there. So let's come to our feet and let's sing this together. Thank you. 
mention of her name. 